and I'm trying to find it on my computer here what we've got. This says you gotta have a roll call. We, uh, we don't need a roll call because everybody's here still, and we'll just roll that over. Is that right, clerk? Unless you want to do roll call, sir. But we're, we're, we're good, so we'll just jump to agenda item number two, is the fiscal year 2019 budget development overview. Finance staff will give a brief overview of the budget development items related to creation of the city's fiscal year 2019 budget. Department presentations will be given at this time. Okay, Mayor Castle, thank you. Uh, Tom Kirkman, Deputy Public Works Director. I'm joined with Jeff Mansfield, Public Works Director. That sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> First time you have to say that. <laughs> so we'll whittle through the street part, uh, service level as quick as we can. Our mission's the same. Um, it's just to provide a safe and uh, uh, efficient movement of traffic through the city of Pocatello. So some of the key services that we provide, we of course do pavement management, we do snow and ice control. We also do street sweeping as part of our stormwater maintenance. Um, we do uh, river levee maintenance all in conjunction with the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, right away maintenance, which is weed abatements, mowing um, in city owned properties that are located in the right of way. We also take care of tra traffic signal operations and maintenance, as well as street lighting. And then uh, we're also responsible for pavement markings, uh, traffic signs, as well as the city fuel site. Some of our key, or some of our outputs, the, we have 33 employees. Um, we've, kinda, we've got it broken into two divisions, the traffic division, which is our pavement markings, our signs and our signals, and then our streets division right now is pretty much covers everything else. Some of our measures of effectiveness, our key accomplishments this, uh, this, this last summer, we were pretty excited. We eclipsed our 40 mile um, goal of treating 40 miles of road last year. Um, that's something we've been trying to uh, get as many miles done every year as we can. Um, we're up to about 15% of our network every year that we're, we're putting some form of treatment on it. Um, so we're pretty excited about that. We're doing a lot of preventative stuff, um, some early stage treatments on some newer roads. Our philosophy is we want to keep good roads good, but we also want to put the right treatment on the right road at the right time. So we've been able to uh, expand our toolbox a little bit. We've got five or six different treatment options that are available to us. So in years past, you would, you know, a road that was maybe in between a pave, maybe in between a chip sill, you just paved it. Now we've got different treatment options that we can do so we can cater it to that road. So we're not spending any excess money uh, because we only have a limited amount of treatment options. <clears throat> so last year we did 11 and a half miles of fog seal. So fog seal is, is a treatment that we uh, applied us to a newer road. Um, we have uh, what's called the pavement condition index. We grade roads from zero to 100. Zero being a road that's completely ruined and 100 is a, a nice road. So everything from about 85 on the PCI scale up, we try and do a fog seal. It's similar to like putting wax on your car or changing your oil, it's a preventative treatment. Um, as roads deteriorate, the, the rocks or the aggregate in it really doesn't go anywhere, it's the oil that migrates out through UV and water. So we try and apply some of that oil back into it with a fog seal. And now as soon as it drops below about that 85 window, that's when we have to go to a heavier treatment. And so those two treatments that we used last year were chip seal and micro seal. Um, chip seal, I'm sure you've all cussed about that. It's the one where you lay oil and then we put rocks over the top of it. Flings rocks for a few weeks until we get it all swept up. Um, and then micro seal. Those two are similar in what they offer to the road. Um, we're looking more at just moving towards the micro sealing. Um, chip sealing is something that's real uh, prevalent in like counties where you can just broom it off the side of the roads. Uh, sweeping costs are getting so, so high anymore that um, it's just, it's almost to that tipping point where it's not real cost effective to do chip seal anymore. Um, I often joke that a street sweeper, if you look at it long enough, it'll break. They're just a, a hodgepodge of moving parts and uh, when they're out sweeping up chips, it's very abrasive and it, it just takes its toll on it. Plus we get, you know, we get a lot of kickback from citizens about it because it is, you know, it can be dusty and if someone's going too fast, it throws rocks. And then we did paving, uh, two, uh, little over two and a half miles of paving this year. Um, 
that's something that we always try and do a, a fine balancing act on to pave a roads about 10 to 15 times what it costs to micro a road and so that's why we want to focus on trying to keep these roads nice so that we don't have to pave until we absolutely have to um, and so um, we try and balance our, our, our uh, pavement management plan so that we do a little bit of preventative, we do a little bit of intermediates, and then we do some structural work as well. Um, we also did some, some storm, grade, uh, storm drain upgrades this year. Um, Yellowstone Avenue has always been really uh, kind of a, a sore spot when it rains heavy. When you're going northbound in the, in the right lane, that tends to the water is super flat through there and it migrates out and it splashes businesses. Um, Yellowstone's actually a state route. We were able to get with the state and do a, co a cooperative effort. They paid for all the materials and we did the work and we were able to put some storm drains there at Pine and, and at Walnut as well to alleviate some of that uh, heavy water flows that come down on, on Yellowstone. So it's kind of a win-win for both of us because uh, you know, a lot of times when it rains heavy and we have that, you know, it, it gives us a black eye too. Even though it's a state route, people don't know that. So it was in our best interest to make that, make that good, so we can keep the public moving. Uh, we've also done some retention ponds. Uh, the most notable one is Foothill. It's over on the west side, above the Riverside area. That's been a real problematic area for a long time. They, they come down the drainage, those big gullies, for lack of better words and uh, it was flooding tra the trailer parks and then some of the, the houses down in the lower lying areas of the Riverside area. Um, we were able to go in there and we, we took about five or six feet of sediment out of it. So we actually got that capacity up to where it can actually hold water now. Um, and we're, we're seeing some of the, the fruits of that labor. So uh, storm water, you can see a, a couple of years ago, I, th I think it was a year or two years ago, uh, Heather and I came before you and asked for two additional stormwater uh, technicians or operators to help us. Um, this kind of just shows um, what a great asset that's been for us. In fiscal year 16, we were able to only clean about 25 uh, stormwater systems that year. And this last year, we've done 611. Um, so it's been a, a huge improvement. And um, I think we kind of started to see the fruits of those labors in, with our spring weather. I'm going to knock on wood because we're still in there. But um, we've been able to kind of mitigate some of our flooding issues um, just because we're getting, we're getting pipes clean so they can actually hold more water. We're cleaning out retention ponds on the upper benches so that that water doesn't have a place to escape and run down to the bottom. With that being said, I, <clears throat> I believe we have... Uh, 10,000 storm structures in the city of Pocatello right now, 5,000 pipes and 5,000 manholes, catch basins, retention ponds. So we still got a long way to go, but we're, we're chiseling away at it as, as quick as we can. Uh, right away projects, we talked a little earlier when we were talking about CDBG about ADA ramps. Um, part of our pavement plan, um, whenever we do certain treatments to the road, like a pave, we'll go in and replace the curb ramps if they're not up to, to code. That's a, a mandate that came down from the Department of Justice a few years ago. Um, so we're working our way through those uh, pretty rapidly. Last year we had some difficulty in getting uh, concrete contractors on to, to get the work done. This year we've got a really good concrete guy and we're hoping to do about, I think it's 40 some odd ramps this year. So we're excited about that. We also were able to get six additional seasonal people uh, uh, part-time to go around and abate and clean up the city. Um, that's one thing that uh, I don't know if you've noticed, that's one thing that we've been pretty proud of. We've had our guys out trying to clean up the city and make it look a little better. They run the alleys. The alleys are just kind of a, uh, they're a never ending battle. Um, but we've also got these guys, they'll go drive main roads, pick up the parent car bumper laying in the road, um, weed eat around bridges. So it's been, I think, a really great addition and we're seeing big dividends from it, I think, from our end. Um, they also assist when there's any abatements through the police department. Um, we're kind of on hold right now with that a little bit, but in the future, that's something we'll, that we'll work with them on. Um, our weed abatement crew, they treated approximately 370 acres between mowing and weed, uh, weed spraying or both. Um, that's one thing that just kind of grows every year. Um, the biggest hit we saw in the last few years was South Valley. All that surrounding area where all that vegetation is, that's, that's a pretty big area that we mow and spray and try and keep those down. So. Uh, pavement markings, we have over 600 crosswalks. We don't get them all done every year. Uh, we were able to get 258 crosswalks done this year. 
Um, the nice thing is, is we're, we're pushing really hard for thermoplastics. Um, so uh, historically, we would paint crosswalks with paint that usually lasts about a year, the tops. Um, thermoplastic, it's about twice as much. It's basically a sticker that you melt down on the road. It's very thick, and we're seeing four to seven years life out of those. Um, it's roughly two to two and a half times the cost, but the, the ROI we're seeing on it's huge. Um, we're starting to be able to get, a, I mean, knock on wood again, we're trying to get ahead of these crosswalks to where we get more and more. And so the amount that we have to treat every year is, is shrinking more as we go. The other thing that we're really proud of is we bought a paint striper and we were able to uh, do all of our own paint striping last summer. Um, it was a learning curve a little bit for the guys, uh, the, the striping crew. We, we had our own striper up until about five, six years ago and we sold it. Um, the, the paint striping has become uh, difficult with the contractors that we had. Um, the state is their primary customer and they they tell us pretty much that we revolve around the state. If, if we have time, we'll come and do it. And we ran into a few problems where we were trying to chase the snow to get stripes on the ground. So we looked at purchasing our own paint striper. Um, our crews got right up to speed with it. Um, they did an awesome job and we were able to get all of our striping done and I, I, they, did a, they did a remarkable job. Our traffic operations center, that's something that keeps growing every year. We're in a cooperative agreement between uh, Bannock Transportation, ITD and the city of Chubbuck. Um, we manage all of the signals in the metropolitan area. I believe there's 66 of them. Um, for the last few years, our traffic supervisor, Mike Neville, has been working really hard on a system called the UDOT matrix, uh, the performance measures. And what that basically does is we upgrade our controllers, we're able to data log the cars as they come in. And so we're able to see if a car shows up on a red light or a green light, and it helps us to um, give us the data we need to be able to make timing changes so that we can get this the, the signals to work a little more fluidly. Does that make sense? Am I moving too fast? I'm trying to just run. catch up. Some of the issues moving forward is always, of course, allocating proper funding for pavement management. Um, unfortunately, um, oil prices go up, you know, and the aggregate prices are climbing. Um, we're okay right now. Uh, you know, we were able to negotiate with our oil suppliers and our aggregate, our rock suppliers, to uh, keep those costs the same, but that's just always a moving target that we never really know um, uh, where we're going with that. And we've talked a ton about our, the fleet department. Our aging fleet is definitely an issue at the street department. Um, last year, uh, we were able to get funding for a new dump truck, so we appreciate that. We're, we're slowly working our way trying to, to get that fleet up and going. Um, one thing we're very proud of and one thing that we want to keep moving forward with is uh, our asset management program. Um, we're, we're tracking pretty much everything we can um, and we're, we're kind of starting to see the limits of the programs. We're not there yet, but we're, we're uh, Within the next few years, I'm, I'm thinking we're gonna start reaching the capabilities of this program and we're gonna start looking. Um, another hot button issue is the stormwater utility fee. It's always, that always comes up. Um, developing a, a, a stormwater division or a department of its own, I think is something that we definitely need to look long and hard at with, for the next few years. We have a new permit coming that's got a lot more restrictions and a lot more um, uh, guidance you could say, and so stormwater is gonna just become more and more prevalent as we start moving forward. Um, and then the other thing that uh, is not really an issue, but something that, to think about moving forward, we've done really a really good job of getting our federal aid project, we call it Fund 70, up to speed, and, and I think most of our federal aid projects right now are close to being fully funded, we're, we're really close to that. We wanna start trying to get a reserve account built for that so that if, the state comes and says we've got a little extra money on the on the on the table and we need to get rid of it we've got some money there so we can start getting these federal aid projects done we can get into these federal aid projects at seven and you know a little over seven percent of the cost of the project and it's it's just a huge home run for us as long as we have the money to to uh, act upon that and then we've talked about this as well with fleet the future planning for the fuel site and we, i think we've talked about that so uh, I don't think we need to go too deep into that. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to go over the numbers for three. 
the overall um, decrease in the personnel is because when um, we did a little bit of reorganization in the street fund, so we moved um, some of the costs over to sanitation. And then we took away um, the 150 that you guys had given to street last year to start the fleet budget. So that's pretty much all that has changed there. They are funded through property tax, um, county road and bridge, highway user fees, um, mostly through all of that. And they do have the 33 employees. Any questions on the numbers? I don't know how you're able to hold that down with, that's amazing. Thank you. We have a great, you have a great street department. They do an awesome job. They take a lot of pride in what they do, so. Thank you. We're proud of them. Mm -hmm. um, so we do have a, a, an increase we're asking for. Our budget's flat. However, there is one uh, uh, increase that we're asking you to consider. The, the utilities on the new facility are going to be a lot more than what we had. Um, and so we're asking for a little bump in our utility fees or our utility costs. Um, that's something if, if we need to try and absorb, we can we can work with that. Uh, but it'll have to come out of some capital or, or like that, stuff like that. So we're hoping we went off of the last few years that the, the Caterpillar dealership was there. And we're pretty confident that those are pretty high numbers that we could, we could try and tame those down a little bit. Um, you know, they ran it as a dealership. The doors are wide open in the winter, you know, stuff like that. So they were running 24 hour shifts. So the power bills are high. So we're hoping we can tame that down, but that's this, these increases are based off what their last year's uh, operating costs were. Are those are the lighting in there, is that all fluorescent? Yes, and they did a they did a program with Idle Power to do some upgrades on those fluorescents in there. Um, we're looking at also right now with Idle Power to do some LED upgrades there. Are these are these increases right here? Will they be split between streets and sanitation? These ones are are the street departments. <laughs> the the yep. street department's responsibility. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so when fleet starts, then it'll split that into thirds. Right now, it's split into halves. So. Okay. It's a pretty big. It's a pretty big jump, but it's it's a pretty big facility. So, Idaho Power indicated the other day that there was a seven percent decrease in rates, so that may help us a little bit. Yeah, and we, we've been tracking that a little bit too with our. Uh, uh, we pay for all of the city street lights in town. It's about four hundred thirty thousand dollars we spend on, on uh, just the lights you see at the corners, and so we're watching that pretty close and. It, it looks like it could be some good news for that as well. Good. Questions, Council? Okay, we'll move on real quick to Fund 70, which is the federal aid projects. Uh, we talked a little bit about it earlier. Um, this fund is doing really well. Uh, we were, a few years ago, it was, we were scrambling a little bit to try and get this, all these projects funded. And uh, between Joyce, Ashley, Jeff, we've kind of got this thing on track. And so, um, right now, we're pretty close. I think the Center Street underpass, the federal aid portion of it is the only thing that we still have a little bit of money to go for our match on that. But um, So we're allocating this year $79,000 to put towards our match and then a little under 13000 for administrative fees. Are we leaving any federal money on the table with not providing a sufficient match? Um, right now, the federal aid stuff, there's not a lot of money out there right now, but th that's uh, where I was kind of going with is when it does come available, it would be nice for us to capitalize on it. Right now, it's uh, there's really not a lot going on, um, but we'll see in the future. To this point, I don't know of any federal aid money that we've passed up not having the match, you know, but we've had to kind of be creative in getting that match in the past, and we, we want to try to avoid that, you know. Um, you know, what, what Tom is alluding to, and a good example of this is the Hawthorne Quinn intersection. You know, right now, the right of way is scheduled for fiscal year 19 with the utility scheduled for fiscal year 20 and construction out in 23. So, you know, if, if ITD or, or Federal Highways comes up with some, some money and is able to accelerate that schedule, we want to have our match in the bank so that if, if that opportunity comes available, we don't have to wait and, and then find a match for that. So. So we're hoping within the next few, you know, the next year or two, probably the next few years, we're gonna be able to just keep this same amount of money that we've been allocating for the last few years to catch us up, just kind of keep it in that and make a little nest egg there for that. Um, the South Valley Connector, uh, we still have, I believe, six payments, five or six payments left 
um, we took a loan from sanitation to pay for the remaining portions of the, of the South Valley, which was a $2 million loan. So um, we're paying $250,000 a year to pay that loan back. So when that, when that comes off the books, that's something we're really excited about because then that's uh, some good money that we can start putting towards these federal aid projects. Okay, so we just need city council guidance on the proposed budget increases. See if we can build those into the budget or not. I, I think you kind of have to. I think I don't. I don't think there's a choice. Turn the lights out. I tell you to show up, but bring us flashlight and, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, insulated gloves so that you can work in there in the winter time. Unfortunately, that's kind of where we're at now. Our <laughs> facility down there. Yeah. So so yeah, we'll. we'll yeah, go ahead, add those. Put them in there? Okay. And then we were just going to go through the numbers for, um, we kind of already went over federal aid. It's just funded by um, the transfer from from street. Let me get there. So we just kind of put aside money for projects that are coming up. And like Tom said, we're just trying to keep that transfer steady right now in case any additional projects do come up so we can possibly build reserves in this fund. And then the other fund we have um, is the fuel fund, which we had kind of talked about. We were doing the fuel charge. So we did increase that. Um, this is their budget and they are funded all through interfunds from departments that use the fuel site. Okay, any questions? One more, sorry. Fleet. <laughs> we built the fleet budget. Um, we, like you said, we've kind of beat it to death, but this is what the actual budget that we came up with for FY19. Um, it includes the two departments, the fleet management, so you're gonna have the fleet manager in there, and then you're gonna have the purchasing person in the other department. And then in 2020, our funds is to move the mechanics into there. So this, we're still working on the inner fund, how it's gonna be broken out between everybody. We're just waiting for a few more things, but it will be fully funded by other city departments. And the plan is that with fleets, you're, you're, we'll get it going. We've got to get the software going, get a person in there, and then 2020, you're gonna move Mechanics, when are we going to start seeing the fleet? October of 2019 is when we want everything turnkey. So, okay. The stumbling blocks, and we talked about this last time, we just had a really hard time trying to get a budget wrapped up because we just didn't have the data to, to track it really well. So that's why we were, we were pushing kind of hard to get this fleet manager position on and then throughout the remaining budget cycle this year, through the winter, they can collect that data so that next year we can set a really strong budget for uh, 20. And we obviously will be able to save this $200,000 with the savings. That's what we're, that's, that's the plan. Well, well, I will tell you, I had a meeting yesterday, actually, and there were a number of mayors there that some of them are doing the fleet, some of them are not, some of them are looking to do it. And uh, Blackfoot's mayor was over the fleet for INL. That was his responsibility, and he figures for Blackfoot, they will save a minimum of $300,000 annually if they go to the fleet. Thing, and so we're, we're quite a bit bigger and so I think we're, you're going to see that savings uh, very quickly. Good. Sounds like it. I think that the level of service also is going to go up if, if we can start taking some of the deferred maintenance and the backlog out so that, you know, uh, when a, when you're ready to use a piece of equipment, it's ready to be used. So yeah. Yep. We'll see. Well, and I think the uh, idea if you have to do a Salt Lake run, <coughs> You're doing it for three different departments instead of one. Exactly. It makes yeah. a big difference there, too. You mean you don't have three people running to Salt Lake well, that's for their department? I know, that's, that's what, what we're doing. doing. Or three different vehicles, three different people. We're really excited about Fleet. I, mean, I think it's it's going to be a great deal. I think it's it, it'll be a pretty big game changer. Yeah. So Thank where you. do you find somebody to run that? Do we have internal people? That so right now we just closed the job. We put it out to, to bid and we got 39 applications. Yeah, and so we're in the process of just going through those right now. Was one of them the Blackfoot mayor? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we need to reach out to him. <laughs> I have to come. Uh, I, 40 years I've lived here, I've never seen the streets look as good as they do this year. Well, thank you. Ever. They're clean, they're well-maintained, they're in good shape. Thank you. Appreciate that. Like I said, we, you have a great street department. They're, they're great people. So they take a lot of pride in what they do. 
We agree with you. Thank you. Any questions? Any other questions? Can I just a quick question, kind of unrelated to the budget? What's the schedule for the um, Center Street? Okay, so the Center Street underpass, um, the federal aid portion kind of got pushed back. Um, you know when that's going to execute? 23 or something? 23 is when it's yeah, And so we've kind of been just kicking the can on the underpass because we were hoping this federal aid would come in. And we're getting to a point where uh, it's hard to sleep at night right now with it. We've got sidewalks that are collapsing. Um, the railings are, are looking rough. We've got chunks falling out. So um, what we're going to do this year with the $250,000 out of excess reserves is we're going to try and just uh, stop the, the dilapidation if for lack of better words lipstick on, on our pig what's that lipstick on our pig yeah we're, we're hopefully it'll be a little bit better than that but we're going to try for it a facelift yeah so we're not going to do anything actually in the tunnel itself um, except we're looking at putting led lighting in there those lights are on 24 7 365 so we're going to do LED light led lighting in the tunnel and as well as the two walking tunnels and then we're going to come in and uh knock off all the loose concrete, sandblast the rebar on the approaches to the underpass. Um, we're gonna put uh, a polymer modified uh, scrub coat of, it's kind of a stucco, but it's cement um, to, to keep that rebar from rusting anymore, seal up all the cracks, put a paint job on it, replace some side, a lot of sidewalk on both sides, and then we're gonna sandblast all the railing and repaint it and then give the whole thing a new a new paint job so and that's happening this year we're gonna yep we're, we're this summer or? yeah we're, we're meeting with contractors i'm meeting with the stucco guys tomorrow um they're really booked up right now so we're trying to get in and and uh, get our name in line so but that's that's what we're shooting for thanks okay any other questions okay thank you We'll move to agenda item number six, uh, service level report for fire and ambulance department. You could probably have Cindy answer your question. We, uh, while you're coming up here, Cindy, real quick, could we get you up here and answer a question for us? And then, then you can go back. You don't have to stay with us. <laughs> Obviously, we'd love it if you stayed with us, but you don't have to. Okay. <clears throat> Hi, Cindy Robbins, Utility Billing Director. So we had a question on the water smart water smart uh, Soft. software. Yes. And uh, we remember asking to find out if there were more different softwares out there and what that looks like. Right. Well, water smart has partnered with Itron and Superion, and so there is no other person that we know that is able to do that because Itron is the one that partnered with them. So there were able to pull their information from our itron system and utilize our superior so both of our softwares that we currently use and that's how they would obtain all their information to provide okay. to the customers so compatibility that was yes okay all right that was our that question was that was it that was easy enough thank you guys okay thank you <laughs> we weren't crazy we kind of I knew are it was a little bit, but like not. That. <laughs> well, that's still debatable. No. Well, it's okay, de debatable. No. <laughs> All right, uh, we'll move on to agenda item six: the service level report for fire and ambulance. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council, Fire Chief Dave Gates. Just uh, going through. Thank you for uh, listening today. Uh, our mission is to help people. Uh, we're de dedicated to preserving life and property through prevention and professional compassionate response. The key services we provide are obviously emergency response, that's kind of a no-brainer. We're also emergency preparedness, uh, emergency mitigation, which is kind of our fire prevention, our community outreach, reach, as well as a lot of administration. And I'll go into each one of these in kind of detail. I like this uh, graph because it shows kind of where we, what we are. That's each year that you can see over the years. Uh, last year was a banner year for us in the emergency services. Uh, we ran 8,290 calls. Uh, you can see that we had quite a few spikes and, and we're just heading into our uh, summer. Just to kind of frame that this year, we're actually 8% uh, down, but we're in our low months. Uh, so I'm kind of looking to see, but it also kind of paints the variability of, of our responses. And, you know, I can look back and last year was a heavy winter year. You would think maybe car crashes would be the driving force, but our car crashes really weren't that much higher uh, last year than they were the other the years before. So uh, it's just kind of the variability of the industry that we're in. 
so in our emergency responses, uh, we respond to a lot of different things. Uh, I kind of like to say that we are a jack of all trades, master of none. We have a lot of things that we are uh, required to re uh, respond to. Uh, structure fires, wildland fires, uh, obviously the emergency medical service, which you see is that big blue uh, circle there. Um, hazardous materials responses. Uh, technical rescue response, as well as uh, we provide aircraft rescue firefighting for out at the airport. Um, I, I want to just touch a little bit on one of the things that I'm really proud of from our department. Our department engaged in the EMS system back in 1978. In fact, I have a, a letter from the governor signed and uh, standing up our EMS system. And we were one of the first uh, fire departments in the state of Idaho to actually embrace EMS. I know that sometimes we think that this is an EMS issue. I can tell you that every single fire department in the state of Idaho that is a municipal fire department of any size runs EMS calls just like we do. One of the key differences between Pocatello Fire Department and a lot of the others, I can tell you Boise Fire wishes they had done this because uh, now fire department EMS in the Boise Treasure Valley is separate. Um, in fact, almost none of the fire departments, they all run EMS calls. So those numbers that you see, I talked to most of the fire chiefs, I just got back from a conference, almost all the fire chiefs um, are responding to EMS calls and it accounts for 70 to 90% of their call volume. That's just the way it is across this, the state. Twin Falls was last, actually the last holdout that didn't run EMS and they've just recently started. Um, it's, it's basically kind of a service level. Uh, we have a county sheriff uh, who could provide police protection, but as a city, we like to provide law enforcement for ourselves and therefore we have a police department. Uh, similarly, a lot of times uh, we have a county ambulance service, but we also provide that added level of service. And I could go into a lot of details of why that's important, uh, but I can tell you that kind of in a simple way of looking at this, EMS are kind of our high volume and it's a low risk resource utilization, fires are a high resource utilization, low frequency. And so we're, by marrying those two, we have a capacity. Uh, just for a frame of reference, uh, the national consensus standard says that for me to fight a four, uh, 2,000 square foot residential structure fire, which there aren't too many of those homes this size anymore, uh, it takes 14 people to do it safely. That's pretty much my entire staff, plus an ambulance um, that are on shift on any given day. You take that to a strip mall or a fire similar to the, the Safe Haven fire, and we really should have 28 people uh, respond to that initial response. So it, by pairing or marrying EMS and fire, we have that base level of, of uh, resources available to fight fire. And all of our personnel are co-trained to do both. And, and our ambulances have SCBAs, and they can respond and, and take initial actions on fires as well. So. So that's kind of my song and dance. Hopefully that answers some of your questions because I know that's always an a question of why do we have EMS and why aren't they paying more? And, and it really is that, that semblance. So. Uh, preparedness, uh, we obviously, part of our job is training. Uh, we spend a lot of hours trying to train. Uh, you know, there's a funny video out there about uh, firefighting and just putting water on the fire and it's pretty simple and just change the agenda, the date on the agenda. But the fact is our industry is incredibly complex anymore. Uh, there's chemicals that we're having to deal with from the hazardous materials. The structures are changing constantly. Some structures are going to uh, metal uh, construction. Well, metal fails at 16 degrees so if I have a firefighter in a, a metal uh, structure uh, at 1600 degrees uh, we're likely going to have a collapse and, and, and have death. Uh, the new TGIs that we have in today's industry are uh, very uh, susceptible to fire. They Once the fire penetrates the, the uh, fire barrier, your sheetrock, uh, your collapse happens very quickly. And so all these things are to change the environment. Everything in the, the rooms uh, burns. Um, I could show you the internal video of the, of the Schubert Heights fire and it was pretty amazing to see how much fire was being spread uh, so quickly. And so it, it's, it's an ever-changing world and it takes a lot of effort. Uh, obviously preparedness requires our apparatus uh, be maintained as well as our equipment, as well as emergency operation plans and a lot of joint ventures between police, fire, and all the surrounding agencies. Uh, from a fire prevention perspective, we do a lot of inspections, business inspections, we include general business license inspections where we go out and inspect businesses to make sure that they're meeting fire code. If you uh, recall the ghost ship fire, that was probably a error in inspecting and not getting out and, and inspecting and they had a fairly significant death. Uh, we also do the annual daycare, uh, alcohol license and sexual oriented businesses. 
And then we have code enforcement, which is really making sure that buildings are built to fire code uh, so that, again, s similar types of things uh, are taken care of. We have our community outreach, which is really trying to prevent people from doing silly things. Uh, unfortunately, that's kind of our industry. We get we we get called when people forget to do things like turn off their stove, or allow their children to play with matches, or uh, play with fireworks uh, when they shouldn't be. And so we spend a lot of time trying to appeal to that. We do everything from smoke alarm, carbon monoxide education installations. We uh, work quite. Uh, lengthy with the wild and urban interface communities to make sure that they're aware of the hazards uh, associated with living in junipers. Uh, we have some great programs such as Junk the Juniper. Uh, we're working with the elder community uh, for fall prevention and spending a lot of time doing that and uh, Kim Stouse does an excellent job. We also do CPR and AED training. Some of our, oh, missed a slide. Oh, nope, they're good. I, I missed it. So these are just kind of, no, you're perfect. I picked two pages up. Um, that's kind of our numbers over the years. You can see that our inspections uh, were up in 2017. We did 914. Uh, we did 297 license and permits, uh, and then 421 at public educations for a total of 1632. Uh, we've estimated that we've reached out to over 24,000 people through all, all the various platforms that we do. On the administration side, just kind of a, a frame of reference, we had to submit uh, the NIFERS as National Fire Incident Reporting System. It's a mandate that we submit those to the state fire marshal, uh, who then submits them to the national account accounting system for, for national fire data. Uh, obviously, we submitted 8,290 of those. Uh, we also are required to do the same for EMS, and we submitted 7,713 uh, to the state EMS for the same purposes. We processed over 15,372 bills. Uh, we, uh, and use the word process, I realize that uh, finance on ends up processing a lot of our invoices, but uh, we have to culminate them, stamp them, and put them through the queue. Uh, we also had 44 P cards for review, and we do 87.5 individuals plus 45 volunteers uh, for payroll entry. And so those are all things that we have to do. We have uh, quite a few volunteers in South County that we take care of. And we had seven grants that we managed. Some of our measure of effectiveness, uh, real proud that we have been uh, above the national average for cardiac survival rates. Uh, I think that says, uh, uh, speaks volumes to our EMS system and our ability to get out and get there quickly and take interve and interventions, get them to the hospital where they can get definitive care. Uh, you know, this is a fairly common number. We're fairly close to right around 92% uh, is where we are nationally or on uh, on a regular basis, year in and year out. Uh, $13 million were involved in fire. Uh, we saved 12, 12 million of that thir uh, $13 million. Uh, turnout time, uh, that's actually a little bit uh, low. If you want to look at standards, we do what I call a lot of cross-district responses. Um, but uh, this, the standard is 60 seconds, 90% of the time. Uh, it's a consensus standard. Um, this is something that, but that's where we are, that we are able to arrive to our call or turnout uh, within 90 seconds, 62% of the time. And we're able to arrive on scene within five minutes and 12 seconds, 62.7% of the time. We've had no firefighter fatalities or uh, civilian injuries. Some of our key accomplishments, uh, obviously the Bitterroot Fire, I think that had the uh, disaster uh, possibility. Uh, we saved uh, uh, two houses, uh, were the only ones lost. We saved the rest of the block. Uh, I think we've also been uh, awarded the Mission Life Award. This is our third year. That's a gold standard award. That's from the American Heart Association. And that's basically due to our cardiac care that we've provided. Uh, we are also awarded the Real Heroes Award again. Uh, we were awarded that um, due to uh, the, the Bitterroot Fire and our efforts there. Uh, real proud of the Junk to Juniper program. It's it's gaining traction. It's basically allowing people to um, replace uh, junipers with uh, fire resistant uh, shrubbery, trying to appeal to them to um, you know do that. Uh, most of the people that live up in the Giant Creek area are, like the junipers. They they like the greenery, and so we're trying to give them a, a safer option to replace that. And that's been uh, in conjunction with a, a grant from Allstate. Uh, and then we have our Remembering When program, which is our senior fall prevention, again, trying to remove or reduce our call volumes in, in venues that we can. 
and then obviously I think it's important that we've uh, received grants and as you just saw we've got a, another $85,000 grant for a water waste trailer so uh, we've been pretty successful with the grants and I guess I, I'd like to point out that we've helped 8,290 people in their time of need. Um, you know, it's generally when they call us, it's a pretty bad day for them, and we've made our, our community feel a little better, and that ranges everything from the, the little old lady whose husband passed away six months ago and is lonely at two o'clock in the morning to uh, the Schubert Heights fire where we pulled uh, citizens out of, uh, out of a balcony and prevented them from succumbing to fire, so. So issues and concerns. Uh, this graph speaks for itself. Dave, yeah. Um, on your accomplishments, isn't the Firewise program really taking off? Um, you know, it, it ebbs and flows. Is I think part of the the Junk the Juniper program is kind of something that we kind of coined with the the Firewise. Uh, we've struggled to get people involved because uh, the people that have lived up there have told us how they are. Um, they like living up there for the reasons that we've talked about, the greenery and the privacy and all that, and so they're really resistant to tearing it down. And we've tried to make that a grassroots, you know, uh, getting the local people to show what can be done and, and get that. So, you know, we're there. Uh, we are firewise in, in the Johnny Creek area, but, uh, you know, it's a designation. It's actually a national designation, but I, I will say I the- thought I heard the other day that uh, the guy that ministers it, administrates it, uh, or, that would be anyway he's backlogged because there's so many people that's joined well so that's region wide and he does have a lot of but I thought Johnny Creek was a big uh, that I hadn't talked to him recently okay. about that so very possible I, I know that there my understanding is that uh, it used to be three rivers RCD um, it's a different program right now so okay um, call volume continues to go up. Um, that's 32.7 percent in the last five years, and well over, uh, you know, since we've been tracking records electronically, um, back in uh, 1995, uh, we're over 250 uh, percent increase in call volume. So pretty substantial. And just for point of note, I mean, when I came on in '94 as a, a rookie firefighter, uh, they had just built Fire Station Five out in South County or in South by South Valley. And uh, and so we really haven't expanded in a fire service sense, uh, despite that increase in call volume. So uh, obviously our call volume does other things. Our roads, as we as we increase this call volume, things such as cross district response, meaning that uh, ladder one isn't available for a call, uh, so uh, engine three or engine two has to come in, and that obviously creates a, a delay in that response because they're having to do that. And you know we're running about you know it depends on which unit but we're running anywhere from 50 percent to about 70 percent in district and the rest is out it's pretty hard to meet your performance standards if you're out of district that often um, and those are all things that i hope that the, the, this master plan will help us identify and figure out which way we should go with that um, obviously we have reduced training time when we're out on a lot more calls there's less time to train so we don't spend time doing you know and I, I, I like this example just because it, it really kind of fits to all of the things we do a lot of things that we don't do on a regular basis we don't do a lot of uh, very rarely do we see rope rescue very rarely do we see trench rescue issues very rarely do we see um, confined space rescues very rarely does a paramedic deliver a baby in the field those are all things that we do infrequently but we're expected to be able to do them should it happen and so the only way we can maintain proficiency to do that is through pretty intensive training so uh, I kind of already talked to the increasing complexities of our calls uh, our, our world is changing uh, it's become much more complex uh, it gone are the days of just putting the water on the red stuff and, and being done and I, I won't uh, beat that up but that's it's all of this stuff is highly technical and highly uh, takes a lot of training time uh, we, we still don't have a training facility uh, for live fire training. I think that's something that we really, it's a standard. We are required to have live fire training. We've been able to do that on um, using uh, what's called acquired structures, uh, but there is a safety factor in acquired structure. It's, it's I call that a more advanced level of, of training uh, because there really is no off switch or no safety switch that shuts that down uh, if things go south on us. Uh, we did submit for a grant in FY17 and that was not uh, approved. And so we'll continue to work avenues to try and get that done. 
Uh, obviously, we are capital intensive. I appreciate the fact that we just uh, solved a, a big chunk of our capital problem. We were able to pick up three fire trucks. Um, but as you know, they're, they're expensive. Uh, we have a lot of aging equipment. Uh, we had a rescue truck that was put on recently, or back when I was hired on in uh, 1999. Uh, it doesn't get a lot of miles, but it certainly is starting to get out of date, and the equipment that are uh, that's on it is out of date. And I have to forgive my staff. They, they were in the middle of interviews, and they uh, just were able to get done with uh, the interviews. So. Um, and, and, and our equipment is really, it's got to work when, when we need it. We can't be fumbling around with uh, trying to get a pump to start or, or, or something that's leaking that should not be. So it, it's required to have a fairly high state of readiness. Uh, the next slide is basically the same thing, only EMS just shows you that we have a lot of, oh, and I, I should speak to the radios. We, we attempted to get a grant this last year for the radios on both uh, for fire and EMS. Uh, we were unsuccessful. We'll certainly continue to work that uh, that. Uh, but we were unsuccessful in getting that grant and that was a disappointment because that was a, a 10 cents on the dollar grant that would have helped us solve one more of our uh, fairly significant capital issues. I think we can kick the radios down to 2020 but at some point we're going to have to to work that problem pretty seriously. So, And then of course any kind of uh, expansion that may come due to Northgate and, and other things we're going to have to, those are all things that we're going to have to be closely concerned with. Uh, obviously, the, the where are we going to put this stuff is a concern. I think that's part of what this master plan will do, uh, looking forward to, to deciding what we need to do. Uh, the standards of cover is really reference to what, what do you as council want. You are the guidance of, of what our citizens want, and a standards of cover which also the master plan will help address is where would you like us to be? What is acceptable level of coverage uh, for our organization? And I think that's it. We're to the fire budget. we can see in personnel there's a negative. What happened was we had a whole bunch of retirements budgeted for an FY18. As you can see, less retirements budgeted for 19. So that's the difference. There was actually an increase of about 42,000 to the wage line. Um, and then it looks like it decreased a little bit. I don't know. <laughs> which, which one? The overall operating. I know that we did some movement between capital outlay and debt service for those new. Yes. Yeah. So I think that that has. That, that's exactly where they moved it, yeah. Okay, and they have 66 employees in the fire department. Any questions on the numbers? So if we put in another station, how many personnel I mean, how many additional? Yeah. So, for at our, our point, we would need uh, four per platoon, so we're going to need 12, and that's basically going to give us, because right now we have a, uh, a vacation schedule slot. We allow for three people off at any given time. Uh, by adding that many additional people, we would exceed the available hours to their build rates, if that makes sense. I mean, the amount that's being accrued. Um, so, we would likely need to plan for, we could probably get by for a year with three per, uh, but we would really be probably looking long term as we uh, aged uh, and, and became uh, increased seniority that we would need that four slot fairly quickly. How are you doing on recruiting? Do we have sufficient numbers that apply when we, when you're interviewing? They've declined. Um, you know, when I hired on, I uh, would guesstimate, I don't recall exactly, but I, it was in the education building up at ISU, and I would say the, the capacity was full, and probably 200 to 300 applicants. Um, I'm not going to say that they were all viable applicants. We have lately been having around 130 applicants, and I have to tell you that by the end of our two year list, uh, we start to uh, not hit what we consider to be good candidates that, that we're troubled with what we're seeing. So we've been working with the schools, pretty proud of that. We work, we've we worked with the schools to try and educate young people at the, as, as this is an opportunity uh, to take on, but uh, we've been doing that with EBCE and uh, the current uh, Pocatello High Schools um, program, their emergency responder program. But we haven't seen fruit from that efforts yet. 
Uh, just uh, real quickly, kind of an outline. We were able to purchase the Cobalt Resolve uh, this year, and we were able to bank uh, 265000 in uh, uh, capital reserves by the end of this. Uh, we also, in FY19, will be able to purchase those three fire engines. Uh, the lease payment will be 204, uh, and we will uh, we estimate our capital reserves uh, to be 271,000 at the end of that point from the fire capital reserves. Uh, we are requesting uh, a total of three additional employees. Um, our staffing level right now is 25. As I told you, three slots of vacation. Our what we call minimum staffing is 20, which means once I hit 19, I have to call in overtime or I have to shut a station down. Um, I've already told you the numbers that are, that are required to respond to a structure fire. So I am just absolutely hesitant and, and quite frank, frankly think it's a safety issue if I were to shut down a fire station. Um, so this puts us with three additional people per platoon to give us a larger buffer um, towards that. Uh, the proposal is that the city would pick up two and the county would pick up one. Um, that would be your, your cost for the two. Uh, I think it uh, will help alleviate some of the burnout that we've been having. Uh, our medics have been going on a lot of calls and as is everybody and I think having a few more people that we can cycle around to the various stations would help um, and I think that it also will alleviate overtime I don't have the exact numbers of what, what kind of overtime but traditionally our overtime has been uh, eroding our operating budget pretty substantially so any questions on those what, is, what do the percentages mean Chief? Uh, that is the, per, for FY17, that's how much of my overtime budget went to that particular thing. So 55% of my overtime budget went to minimum staffing. Uh, and then 14% went to hazmat operations, which is grant funded. So, you know, we would lose some revenue if I quit doing the hazmat uh, training. Uh, the reduced training, 9% uh, was just for training. Uh, for us, unfortunately, for me to send anybody that's from on shift to training generally costs money. It costs overtime because if I send that person off shift, uh, then I have to put somebody in their place. It doesn't always, and I try and, we try and get the crystal ball out and look to see if, if, if it looks pr uh, promising that, that our staffing levels look good that day. But, uh, I, you know, so far my crystal ball isn't very perfect. So I, often it, we don't know when somebody's going to call in sick uh, the day of the, the event. Um, so the other one, just kind of to run through those, these are all uh, at last year's fiscal year numbers. Uh, red flag warning and fire suppression. When we, uh, for example, on the Safe Haven fire, we brought in an entire platoon uh, to work because it, the fire was that big and, and firefighting is a very arduous uh, job and they have to be cycled through. Uh, it, it would be about like asking a guy to do the 50 yard dash 14 times in a row without any break and, and do it effectively. And it's, it's just something, it's a very arduous uh, thing and we have to bring it in. So anytime we have a fairly significant fire that looks like it's gonna be protracted, we bring people in. Red flag warnings when we are, let's say, uh, weather service uh, protocol, uh, they tell us when there's a high probability for a fire, uh, wildland fire, and that it would be an extreme. Uh, we bring in uh, brush trucks and actually have them rove in the hills for a rapid response and deployment. Um, again, in my opinion, putting the fire out when it's really small is worth its weight in gold because if it gets big and ahead of steam, we'll never get it. Um, and then uh, use our operations is another portion of our of grant funding. And so those are, those are our big, big numbers in our overtime driver. Uh, the next thing we're asking for is 11500 for turnouts. Uh, our turnouts, uh, we have a turnout replacement program, uh, but these last couple of years we've had a lot of turnover in the department. Turnouts are kind of customized. It's kind of like buying a tailored suit. Uh, you don't generally want to put somebody in something that's either going to get caught or bound on a piece of uh, fallen debris while they're crawling through a, a blacked out uh, structure. So they're custom fit uh, and we uh, have them for that person uh, for uh, several numbers of years. They have an age factor on them. The, the manufacturer actually tells us when they should be pulled out of service. And so uh, they're, they're going up. They've been going up 7%. Uh, and what we've really been having to do is offset our, uh, we're using funds out of our other safety gear to help uh, maintain our turnout uh, replacement program. 
the next one is our, our what are called ticks. Uh, I don't know if, the, if any of you have come out and seen them. These are those things that let us see at night or see through smoke and gas and things like that. Uh, when I first joined the fire service, they were $25,000 a piece and, and they were pretty rugged. Uh, we've been buying ones that are uh, quite a bit cheaper. The technology obviously has gotten better, uh, but they're also not as rugged and we've been wearing those out uh, fairly regularly and uh, we're in need of those. I'm not gonna read all those slides, but uh, these are used in all sorts of things, everything from scene and fires to we've helped the police find uh, victims at night because we can see movement in the dark and uh, you know through the just the thermal imagery of a person. They're pretty cool. Uh, the next one is a Knox box. Uh, just an, a little explanation of a Knox box. Uh, this is a two-part system. One part is a business will take a key or put a, a hardened uh, key holder and they'll put it on the outside of their building. Uh, and that hardened key holder has a key. Uh, and what it allows us to do is if we have a fire alarm or uh, a report of a fire, but nobody's there to let us in, it's late at night, uh, we can use our Knox box key to open up their key holder, pull out their key set and access their building using that. The Knox box systems are around a long time and uh, what we're trying to do is upgrade on our rigs because uh, <laughs> I hate to say this, but I used to literally have an Oxbox key on my key ring and that's kind of embarrassing kind of a not a, a good safe way to have a key that lets me into every facility Knoxbox has to guarantee they have an insurance policy that says if any everybody ever breaks in the new systems are designed so that the key is in the fire truck uh, and it's locked you can't pull it out unless you key in your uh, ID number and that way it tracks when somebody takes it out and when somebody takes puts it back in and so we know exactly who's accessed that key and we need to have that upgraded. It allows us to change, uh, for example, uh, if we have a disciplinary issue, it allows us to change these from a fairly quickly uh, program somebody out of the system. How many businesses around town use that? Ooh. Probably about uh, roughly 200. I have a question on that too. Is there any kind of fee associated with that since I would assume it's benefiting that business to not have you forcing your way in and causing damage like they put their we, own we've never yeah, assessed they purchase, they purchase the boxes themselves and uh we have the key the only keys to get into it they don't have a key for it so if they're purchasing them the nine thousand is just these these are the systems that go yeah. inside you should come up there to <laughs> say who you are <laughs> Andy Holmes, uh, Assistant Chief of Support and Public Safety. Um, okay, so these are the systems that, that go into the apparatus. And, and that's what he was saying, that every apparatus will have a, a key in it that has a code that's a personal code for every individual on the department. And the upgraded system is, of course, a lot more technologically advanced. And we we're able to uh, update any code uh, just at a, any computer so right now we have to go around and manually reprogram each box and there's there's like 15 boxes right now uh, units inside of each apparatus so it's very very labor intensive and uh, it could take a while to do that and they uh, chief mentioned that this way we could uh, instantaneously you know lock somebody out if, if there is disciplinary issues and whatnot does that answer the question I, I think what you were asking is are we charging <coughs> companies yeah. any kind of a fee for this and no currently we're not yeah okay are there any other places that do that maybe we should look into that so it's not having to come out of tax but it's the person who's benefiting it from it more and that helps offset some of the cost or is that not I, I have never asked that question I'm okay. certainly willing to it seems to me like the whole city is benefiting right now and you'd have to kind of go throughout the city and, and teach location of Knox box and ask them if they would chip in you know uh, unless you say every new Knox box that is purchased will have to charge uh, a fee for it is that what you're asking well yeah so that we don't you know because you're yeah. gonna have to upgrade sometime in the future too even if we upgrade this now right so that could help Correct. yeah plan for the future a little bit maybe I don't know yeah we've, we've never thought about doing doing it like that but that's that could be a possibility absolutely 
And can I just clarify, you said that um, currently the business owners are paying for their own box. Correct. So yes. if I understand correctly, you're saying this money is to upgrade what you were saying there would now be the key in the truck that could not be and we currently have that without entering a code or correct and we have is? we currently have the yes okay. so there's there's two points to this system one is the, the box that's building. mounted in the on the wall at the building yeah. and then there's the box that is the key that holds the key it's not really a box right. it's literally your key slides into it and the only way the key will release is if I enter my code. This key opens this box that has, then the owner is obligated to put the keys to their facility in there. But and this money is paying for that key. For this part, and not yeah, the key, but the box. Their money is already paying their for Their money is box. paying for the box. Okay, I just Correct. wanted to be clear on that. Yeah. But potentially and, and, and there could yeah, be. Yeah, absolutely, a because you're correct. I mean, if you get a fire alarm uh, at two o'clock in the morning and we don't see smoke, but we need to gain access, can't get a hold of anybody, um, this is how we save a thousand dollar door. Um, so. so when you say the current system is no longer serv serviceable, it's still working, it's just that it has better technology now, is that right? Or what do you mean uh, by that? Well, if there was any repairs needed to be made on, on, on that unit, then Knox doesn't repair. We'd have to buy a new, a new unit to replace the old one. Okay. Kind of like computers at some point they say we're not going to provide technical support yeah. for yeah. this this anymore. <laughs> but it's not like it's not like they're broken right now. It's no. just that if we had an Correct. issue. Yeah. Okay. And we did have an issue and we you know to me I, yeah the idea of you know to turn that off because it, it and the police kind of have the same type of thing. They have keys that allow them into places, you know, that have security alarms and, and that's a pretty big responsibility. If we had somebody who went rogue, that would be a bad bad thing to have uh, accessible to anybody. Uh, kind of similarly, but uh, slightly different, would be a station security system uh, around here. We have all the badge key codes. Uh, our, our All of our stations do not have any kind of technological advancement. We have key codes, but they are literally the manual punch key codes that uh, the only way we can uh, undo that is to literally go around. And when we recently had a disciplinary issue, it took us a day and a half to go around and actually change all of our locks. And, uh, you know, we actually give access to people like uh, Ameripride uh, when they come and deliver laundry, uh, the sheets and the linens. Uh, and I think, you know, having that kind of a system where it's that com complicated to uh, detour anybody, uh, plus having uh, some knowledge of access. Um, we would like to start the process of upgrading. This is to upgrade one station, um, and we would just plan on doing that over time. Uh, the last one is uh, station one is our last station that all of our stations now have been upgraded to have um, I don't know, I call them the truck stop bathroom where it's kind of a, you know, it's the, the bathroom itself is all isolated. It's a singular shower, uh, a door. Um, you go in there and shower. It, it's uh, female friendly. So in, in departments, as we uh, uh, prepare for uh, having uh, female firefighters in the future, this allows for uh, all stalls to be, uh, you know, single occupant usage for lack of a better uh, word. Um, and uh, our stations, the, this station one was built in 72. Uh, it's kind of the old open bay style of, of restroom shower situation. And so this would allow us to upgrade that to the style that we have in all the other fire stations. Um, I put a note on there because uh, if I were going to expand, and right now we are at the point where uh, if we were to hire the, sing the three people that we're talking about, I would be able to put them at station five, um, but the next place that I have a bunk available if all staffing is available at, is out at the airport. And so um, kind of along the lines of what we have talked about in the past was a slow buildup within the fire department 
and then we build a station and then move staffing over. And if I were to do that, station one is our prime location. It's our busiest station. It's centrally located, uh, which is the one by Albertsons. And I would uh, do an expansion on top of station one, uh, put the dorms there that would allow for us to run two units out of station one when staffing allowed, uh, which would reduce our uh, cross district response because it's our busiest station. It would also allow us to have that vehicle staffed when possible um, at, and when available and then once we get have that regular staffing and that uh, capacity and we choose to open a fire station in some other location we draw that station down and move those individuals to that station um, and so that's I, I would say that if if there's an inkling in your mind of doing that, then this is something that we could postpone and just take care of during the upgrade uh, of that expansion. So, uh, proposed fee increases. Um, I'm gonna let Chief Holmes talk to a little bit about these. These are mostly in his, his wheelhouse. Okay. The fireworks display permit. Uh, we do have a, a sales permit right now that is combined with a display. Uh, we would like to split that off into two different permits so that there's a sale of fireworks and then a display of fireworks. And a display is just a show, a fireworks show to, to define that. Uh, $125 is pretty much the standard around the state and that's where that $125 comes from. The so, so and Andy, before you move on, uh, fireworks display permit, are you talking about everybody in the community that wants to light up a fire <laughs> in, in a residential area that they're buying a permit for it? Or? Can you imagine how much money we can make? Well, well yeah. yeah. <laughs> no. I can also see a lot of phone calls because of that very line right there coming in here. This would be like a, a public display. Uh, no, in answer to that question, no, it's not an individual uh, display, but where somebody would want to put on an event for a grand opening or something, and then they would they would need to go through this process. State code requires uh, you buy a permit to display what are currently considered illegal fireworks, aerial fireworks are illegal. You as an individual citizen cannot shoot off aerial fireworks as a display you can if you're putting it on as a if isu wants to have a fireworks display and bring in a professional uh gray show in idaho which is now just changed its name um celebrate fourth celebration uh that's the display that we're referring to not not consumer grade fireworks or safe and sane no yes Okay, I'm gonna ask another question. It's gonna be a stupid one. But I know we drive 15 miles north and we buy the aerials. I'm gonna run over to Heidi's house and watch one. Does she have to buy a permit for it? <laughs> I'm not supposed to be shooting those off anyway. I know that. <laughs> I know that, I know that. But I mean, I'm just, okay, I'm, I'm just saying, okay, and I think, I think I know the answer, but I also, can see where this can be going with some of the public going and say, wait a minute, you have a firework display and it's for fireworks that go in the air and my neighbor's lighting them off and he doesn't have a permit. He's going to call Chief Marchand and say, hey, Chief, I want to know why you don't have a policeman up here because they don't have a permit to do this. So, I mean, where are we going with this? Uh, I think the definition of, of a public display is, uh, it wouldn't be like necessarily at Heidi's house. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. She's not going to buy them anyway. She's a rule follower. <laughs> Linda now, she might. And so. Thank you. You let us know, okay? Well, no, I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to go watch the fireworks. <laughs> yeah. Um, but isn't that illegal to begin with? So, well, correct. Right? So the police yeah. should be there well, citing her anyway, say. not about the It's permits. not going to change anything. Well, that's okay. not changing a whole heck of a lot. I'm, I'm just saying, oh, is this another spot where somebody's going to call and complain because their neighbor doesn't have one of these? Firework permits. Uh, are you uh, supposed to have one now anyway? Is what you're telling me. We, we have this under a, an no. operational business permit, and it's, it's kind of a, in our codes. It's it allows us to charge a permit for any kind of. That's what they call it, an operational 
permit to to have to perform some either construction or an action like this and it's just a single single use basically it's not like for an annual that would that would be a little bit different in this case this is kind of more geared towards a commercial type of display you know I mean if we need to define it further and deeper then then let's do it you know but I mean to me this was pretty obvious obviously to other people it might not be so let's further define it if we need to but in fire code I think it's well defined and it's really based on a licensed person a person who is licensed to shoot off display fireworks for a public viewing I can't become licensed because I buy so I for example I suppose that if Heidi wanted to get her license to shoot off fireworks to do a neighborhood and she wanted to do a neighborhood show and she went to us with a permit then she could qualify to do that provided that we looked at this scenario and said yes we feel that this is a safe area to do that this isn't a loophole then that somebody can go and buy a permit and say now I'm legal to fire off anything I want well in order for them to buy a permit we would we would pretty much have to approve the the conditions for that so but they had it at the Bannock County Event Center anyway because that's not city yeah it's so they correct but if they ISU has though ISU has uh, wanted a permit to shoot off fireworks up at the Red Hill area okay sports field all right, sorry to <laughs> go off track. But. Okay, uh, fire alarm system plan review and installation. That the second line there, we just did not have in the last exhibit L the hundred dollar base fee added to that. It, it was just four dollar, uh, four dollars per device, and we do need a a base fee to cover. A small installation such as daycares that only have one or two devices it seems impractical for us to just charge eight dollars for for our time and an effort to go inspect that and make sure everything's working correctly so we just added that base fee into the the alarm the third one commercial tank installation and removal this is something that kind of puzzles me because this was in previous exhibits and it wasn't in there when I reviewed it this time we've always charged this for the installation or removal of a above-ground fuel or hazardous materials tank so it's just kind of reflecting the actual cost as you see of, of what we're actually doing that's all I got cool. <laughs> all right so uh, we would be asking for is the guidance on the the two firefighters uh, the thermal imagers the turnouts the Knox box station security system the bathroom upgrade and also the proposed fee increases so i think we should put the employees in the list like we did okay. with the other ones previously like and then solution. yeah and then um on some of the other ones it seems like they might be more of like a one-time expense so i was just wondering if if that's something that could or should come out of capital this is a question for finance well, rather than then changing the budget on an ongoing basis so the thermal imagers we're, we're trying to get on a replacement plan so this is kind of a you know buying them so that's not for all of them that's no just this for isn't them. for that's all of right. them <laughs> i yeah, wish for, so that would be ongoing <laughs> And, ongoing. and then turnouts are absolutely an ongoing that's something that we're in a, a constant we're only replacing how many, how many turnouts are we replacing because they're four every year i don't have that i didn't okay. have that four, answer four, i know four, four, we, we're trying to replace a certain number of our turnouts well, and it's i want to say it's a five-year plan where we're trying to roll through every five years and have our turnouts replaced but would the Knox box, the security that. system, and that's the kind of a one, that's a one-time purchase. The bathroom is a one-time purchase, and so would be the station security. Now, again, that was a phasing in, so ultimately we would be looking to do five of those for all of our stations. So, the station security is something that we would probably need either some ongoing authority or to look at it from the perspective of adding multiplying that by five and getting them all done at once 
because you're saying that that was just the that start. was just one right this is probably the biggest one the other ones are gonna be oh he, he said this station is the biggest one so the other stations would be less okay but that wasn't what the numbers we worked out station ones are a bit, bit has the most access doors so the Knox box system and the bathroom upgrade could be capital expenses what, and what the turnouts you, are ongoing what do you have in your budget right now for turnouts oh i don't have that number off the top of my head Twenty five thousand. so you're at it you're asking to add eleven thousand to that twenty five thousand yes sure Barry Castle, Chop Smith, Operations Chief. Uh, I think the chief alluded to it a little bit, but our, our cost of our tow nuts are going up quite a bit. They're about $2,500 a pair, plus or minus a couple hundred bucks. And we're seeing attrition where we used to have uh, some in reserve, but we've used them all up. Anything that any retirees turnouts get used again, if we can find somebody they fit. And so with higher than normal attrition going forward, we have a big group of people that are gonna be, the big plug of employees are gonna leave the department in the next five years. And they're not gonna have, we're gonna have to increase that line item alone, but replacing the turnouts for the guys from the past 10 years has to be done every 10 years also. And then um, with that increase, so we're about, we're about $11,000 gets us three, four sets of turnouts is all. And uh, depending on how good Chief Smith, you know, purchases. So uh, we have a problem of not replacing them adequately in the past. We have a problem with gonna need more in the future. And uh, this will just start the process of get, trying to get ahead. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. and, and for example, just hiring the three, you, you, we'll use almost all that just to, to get turnouts for those three additional people. And so another complication of this is, um, you know, we have, and, and we're trying to get ahead to where all of our turnouts have maybe not a compliant set of turnouts, but a backup set of turnouts. Because once you go into a fire, they're wet, they're cold, they're filthy, they're dirty, they're carcinogenic. We, we put things in place to try to wash them and clean them, get them turned around and laundered as soon as possible. Uh, and so we're really also working and not staying ahead of, of getting a backup set of turnouts for our folks if they have to send them in for repairs or anything like that. And then we're scrambling to find a, a, a suitable set for our firefighters to wear. And that's not our highest priority right now. Our highest priority is just trying to keep our our noses above water on fitting new guys and replacing old guys and then they can use their I would say not perfectly and and maybe uncompliant turnouts as a backup set for a day or so why we um, get theirs you know tailored if we have to get them repaired they have to be sent out nobody here will do repairs anymore so that's usually about a two-week process multi-layered problem and and that's the cost for a one turnout, is that? No, no. one turnout is about 2,500. Oh, right, right. Mm -hmm. And we can move anything to tax solution to if you guys want to think about it. We can add it to the budget. It's kind of your decision at this point. I'd like to suggest that we the expenses that are one time that could come out of capital assistance that we do that the personnel we're going to look at in tax solution um, but that we approve the other ongoing expenses to the budget i think the turnouts we have to they're necessary so just to be clear so you want you're suggesting that we do we put the Knox box system and the bathroom upgrade into capital, mm -hmm. and then push everything else to tax solutions, including the personnel, the turnouts? No. I was suggesting approving those. Oh, got it. The personnel would be tax solutions. Right, and everything else put towards capital. Okay. So your capital would be your bathroom, and what else? Knox box. Knox box. Those are the only two things that would go into the capital improvement. Mm -hmm. Then the others, I, I think that you, you look at these, you know, the turnouts seem like that's a pretty important deal. I mean, you don't want your firefighters going into a building without compliant. I, I know you said a couple times non-compliant. I don't like that word mm -hmm. when I'm asking somebody to go into a fire. So I'd like the compliant ones. So if it's there 20, 
550, maybe spend the extra 50 bucks to get the compliant <laughs> ones as opposed to the non-compliant <laughs> ones. I would support that, so so you know. So I, I, just to just speak to what he's we talking. only buy compliant. <laughs> we do only buy compliant. I, I, you know what, what uh, Chief Smith is really talking about is that, you know. I don't know, manufacturers today uh, have their born on dates, for lack of a better word, and they're saying that after a certain time, uh, the, the police experience this with bulletproof vests. Uh, at some point, they say, and, and most of this, we're, we have the same, a turnout is made out of the same stuff. It's It's got Kevlar impregnated into the outer structure. And so what they're saying is that at cer a certain date, they're no longer, they're not, good anymore they exceeded their born on dead they're not compliant we're kind of in a risk management scenario and when you do go into a fire and as i've suggested all the gases that are in there are carcinogen they come back out they're covered in soot they're covered in all the smoke and it's in their collar and it's close to their membrane and that absorption factor is horrible for firefighters that's why they have proven statistics that say that firefighters have a higher rate of cancer than almost any other profession so we're in that risk management assessment. Okay, we're gonna take you out of your compliant turnouts. We're gonna send those off to get washed. We're gonna tell, put you in your old set of turnouts that are no longer compliant, they're born on date, but we're, we're hedging that risk because we don't want you to get cancer. We wanna get your turnouts clean, but we have this set that you can use as a spare. Does that make sense, what, what we're trying to accomplish? And we're trying to use that spare for a very limited amount of time. To me, it makes sense to do the, the turnouts. The station security system, I mean, you lock that place up, it's locked up now, just like it is anywhere else. We could spend a lot of money on City Hall and the police department's security system, and and then you go to the street department. You, I mean, there's a lot of those. I, I don't think I would put that one in, quite frankly, right now. Um, we've got a major increase in expenses hitting us across the forehead, and every dollar we put in here, we, we could raise taxes 3%, and that's gonna get us to almost part of what increases we know are already there right now, and so I, I, I would leave that one out, quite frankly, um, and the thermal imager, how many do you have? I have to go back to the slide data review. We have a lot of them. We have four that are now just completely not working. Um, they're the originals we bought in 1999. Is that something right, Curtis? 1999. They're big, bulky ones. We replaced uh, four of them with some less than quality ones. They're not the top of the line by any means. And we've had all kinds of service issues, battery life issues, and all this stuff. They're still running front line. We've been able to find you know, some wiggle room in our budget, buy some demos like I talked about for about two thirds of the cost to get two of them replaced, to have them on a frontline ambulance or engines. We've moved those less than good ones back to reserves where we can and use them as front lines like we do with everything when we need, um, we need repairs or something like that. We need two to have all of our frontline apparatus with the newer style, lighter, more serviceable, have a warranty, stuff like that to get us there. And then we can move the, the remaining two back to reserves status does that get your answer Mary? so it, it kind of is 12,000 by two or does that buy eight what does that buy that buys one 12,000 buys one that buys one and if, if Chief Smith can get a good deal and get us another new demo for nine grand Travis is Superman he can just look in there with his eyes and see him can't he I, I'm Travis and that's Curtis Curtis I mean I'm sorry Curtis <laughs> but he usually works us a good deal and does a really great job with that so that's probably the high end but I can't promise you we can buy a demo right now so you know we've got the demos for around nine thousand dollars so we need two for our front end we need two right now we're asking for one See, I think you could, I, if it were me, I would put the one that you're asking for, I would take it out of tax and I would put it into the the capital improvement or whatever that is so that, that we can get that and then revisit it next year to see if we if we can get that. It's, so they're put expensive. The, put the one into capital assistance? That's what I would do. I think that's what I would do too, put the, the one tick out of capital put the turn it, turnouts in for the for, budget. Uh, budget ongoing in the mm -hmm. budget um, knock box and the bathroom I would say let's put that in for tax solution and then if we or I don't know 
If, if I were Same king for a day, what I would really do is I would drop the bathroom and I would buy two of your your ticks with the capital and not worry about the bathroom. Yeah. But I don't know if that's doable. That bathroom's in really rough shape. I know right? it's in rough shape. <laughs> okay. And if it makes a difference, we actually interviewed a candidate today that was female. She's not eligible in terms of our, our hiring ranking, but uh, she was a good candidate, and there's a good chance that we'll see that again. Mayor, just on a lighter note, we'll yeah. invite you over to shower with the guys because it's open <laughs> stalls. <laughs> We're not even going there today on that one. We're going to leave that one alone. I appreciate the invitation, though. All right. <laughs> I'm just throwing that out. I'm trying to get you what you need. And we appreciate that. I, I, I mean, I I'm trying to look that. at this and say, what what do we need? And it sounds like I just heard we need two ticks. And, and honestly, like as I said, and if we, we want to bathroom. totally upgrade Station One in a year or two years, um, it's probably not where I would throw twenty thousand because we may revamp that to an entirely different format. Um, because we really need office space too. Our office is we're hemmed in. We don't have any room to expand our front office space. And so that's the other solution that if we expand station one and the number that we've thrown around is about 550,000 to put a deck on top, put all the dorms, move a kitchen up there, that would become crew quarters on top of station one. And then that allows us to convert all the rest of station one's main floor to training, to office space and other things. And um, so I, I, I mean, I'm at, at odds with this too because I really do think that we need to expand Station One, uh, and and allow for that slow build out, uh, and and eventually we can run two apparatus out of there until we get enough staffing to open another station. And if you were to hire a female firefighter before, before that, that were ha were we to would happen, have to put her at Station Two or Three go? or Five, and that could <laughs> be done. Yeah, I mean, we do have one room at Station One that's that that is has an isolated bathroom that we could put her at Station One as well, and under the current structure. Okay. It's just that this the standard has really moved away from open showering and, and all that kind of stuff, and so it's you know it should be addressed at some point. But if we're if we're looking at spending five hundred fifty thousand dollars to expand Station One, then I would say the the, the nineteen thousand because I don't I'm not even sure it would be a bathroom as it currently is right. it might be a single bathroom just to accommodate whoever happens to be there without any showers I know the guys from a safety perspective having two ticks and foregoing the bathroom would be a good thing well I'm gonna tell you what I would do here and then I'm going to see what the council says. I'm going to throw it out there. I'm going to be the guy that everybody at the fire department's upset about right now. I'd put the the two employees, I'd put them in the tax solution. We'll see what happens there. The turnouts, I would put them in the budget. I think that's a necess necessity. Uh, and uh, for sure, if we're able to get the, uh, everybody, eventually get everybody to compliant <laughs> turnouts, <laughs> not compliant turnouts, killing me. I would buy the two ticks with uh, capital improvement. I would not buy the the knock bo the knock box knocks box. box. I would not do the security system, and I would not do the bathroom. And if we do have a chance to hire a female firefighter, then the bathroom I would say we bring back to the city council as an emergency expenditure, and do it that way right now. Right. And, and go from there. So you're proposing upping the 12 to 24 for two I'm ticks? I'm proposing I would, I would do the 12 to 24. I'd buy the two ticks that you need because it sounds like you need two of them. That's what I would do, but I would do that out of the capital improvement fund. I would put the turnouts in the ongoing budget because that's necessity. And everything else uh, right now, just knowing where we are with the budget and what it looks like, I would drop everything else out with the understanding that if we have a female, then uh, the firefighter that we end up really truly needing to do an emergency fix on those we'll bathrooms. Sign up to a different station. 
for the next yeah. well, and you said we, we, we can put them at any station. There's some other yeah. there is a there is there's a bathroom at there's station one that we uh, it's a it's a the dorm room itself has its own bathroom. Okay. So we have that option, but it's for one, you know, again, it, it's really more that we can work with we it until we get the theory. bathroom fixed. I wouldn't even spend it for that, honestly. I, I'm just saying, I think the bathroom is old and it's really something that we need to look at going forward, uh, regardless of female or non-female firefighters. It's really the standard. I mean, lots of people don't like showering in front of lots of people. And this is open and that's just, I agree. It's something that we're going to need to do eventually, but I'm also looking at the sure. reality of where we are today and, and where we hope to be tomorrow. And I don't see us spending that in, in there. I feel comfortable with what you've recommended, Mr. Mayor, but I think this is the area that's going to cost us the most money with the expansion into the North Gate. And so I'm much more inclined to be bold and move forward with the expansion and the addition on Station 1. We would love to work towards that. So you suggest an add in $500,000 to this thing? Yeah. If that's I, I, we're going to have to bite the bullet sometime because I, I think this thing's going to happen. And, and uh, I, I think protection is going to be really, really important for us. So if you do that, though, is is Station 1 the right place to put a half a million dollars, or just, would it yeah. be a station in the Northgate area that you could use the 500000 Ideally, I would there. like to see that new station in, in Northgate. But, uh, so kind of a, to address that, well, first of all, what I, I would like to see is get this master plan done. I, I think that's fair. Let's get that done. Um, this we could do a mid-year amendment if we really if the master plan comes out and recommends a particular thing. station one is a very central location it's it's an excellent location to, to, to cover everywhere and so when and, and it's our highest call volume station so the expansion there affords us the ability in a traditional firehouse you would actually run a ladder company and an engine company out of that fire station. And, and that is the station, given all the high rises that we have around that area, that would be the ideal location to do that, that combination response model. So I, I think it is the right place. I think spending the money, but I let's do the master plan. We don't need to add it to the budget right now. We can come back with a plan, with a mid-year amendment, if that's where, you know, after we get the study done, we can come back and make that recommendation and why. Remind us when the master plan is supposed to be done. Well, you're going to approve it on the 17th, and they will okay. have it done by probably August. Okay. Is what they said, and they will ask for your input. That that that's part of the process is asking for what. Well, that makes sense to do that. I, th I think we've got a plan, so that's good. That make that makes sense to find out what what that looks like. I agree with that. I know that we need an upgrade, and I'm really uh, the bathrooms. And I'm sorry, guys, because I'm suggesting we don't do that this year. But well, they have porta potties. Do they have? No, <laughs> we're not doing. We're, we're, I'm not even going to ask for porta potties to come in. And so, well, I think that the, out of fairness, again, if if we expand Station One, the remodel that we will do on the main floor of the station may not look anything like what it looks right now, and so it probably wouldn't be the shower bathroom arrangements to accommodate the 24 hour living, it would be more of a bathroom for an office. It would look more like the bathroom that we have here. And I don't want to waste the money building stall showers, stall uh, bathrooms when we're going to end up gutting that all out and making a, a normal bathroom. Sense. I think any bigger uh, light bulbs in station one, it's dark and dreary when you go in there. It's good to have you in Lexington. Okay. Okay. So what are we adding to well, the budget? Right now, <laughs> and that, I didn't hear anybody argue with me on the turnouts, and okay. so I would add the turnouts. Ticks we'll out two ticks. Capital. And I would put the ticks, two ticks, but pull them out of capital, and I would drop everything else because I haven't heard anybody else say up here say, no, we've got to have that immediately. What about the fee increases? Oh, the fee increases? We didn't talk about them yet, and I yeah, think they're good ones. Good. As long as Heidi can get that permit for her <laughs> business, I won't. We're going to her house. <laughs> You're going to do a show for all Apparently, I'm being <laughs> volunteered. Okay, so we're going to move on um, to EMS. And again, this is kind of informational only. This is primarily, this is through the county, what we're asking for them. Okay, 
Okay, so here's the numbers. Um, wages and benefits up by about 44,000, and then just movements between the lines. So overall, fairly flat. Um, and this is funded by Vanley County, and there are 21 employees. Well, if we can get the county to pay more, couldn't we put some more in this budget? <laughs> yeah. Put the I think you'll be happy to see what I, I'm proposing. Uh, now, the county may not be, but they've been actually pretty been, uh, working with us uh, quite well. So, uh, again, the, I'm asking for them to fund one of the employees. I won't go into detail. We've already talked about that. We are asking for a uh, 30000 increase in medical supplies, uh, clearly with the increase in calls, uh, as well as medical devices and supplies are becoming more and more high-tech, and everything that we buy is more expensive. Uh, it's just the way it is, uh, and we're going on a lot more calls so asking for that uh, the next one is we're asking for basically a net increase of about 20,000 to continue replacing our ambulances and our uh, yeah, with the net the net sorry it's a total but our, it's already 205 is already in our budget so we're asking for a $20,000 increase um, to fund the ambulance and a power cut auto loader uh, we're asking that they actually start paying for part of the city admin fee, uh, which they haven't been, which is basically paying for HR finance, uh, legal, and all the things that they do provide for us. Now, they're, by contract, they're limited to 1%. Uh, I'm going to say that this number may adjust a little bit because they are paying 17000 for IT, and I don't know whether they'll view IT as part of the admin 1% limit on admin. If it is, then that number would be 50,000 minus the 17,000 that we're currently paying for IT. If they'll buy this as admin and that IT is somewhat separate, then we'll get the, we'll ask for the full 50,000. Don't remind me about the IT thing and then we'll think about it. So. <laughs> Um, the next one is we're asking for uh, uh, basically an advanced life support mannequin. These are high fidelity mannequins that allow you to run cardiac rhythms as well as all sorts of uh, various uh, shock trauma type scenarios where the paramedics can uh, visualize actual um, uh, signs and symptoms uh, of a patient and then uh, be forced to take action, you know, either through cardioversion or, or things like that. They're, they're pretty expensive, uh, so we're asking for one of those. Who provides the training on this? The company. The company provides the training for those. And then we'll probably, we'll get somebody who becomes an expert on the device itself and, you know, Inter is, is internally to provide that. Uh, we're, this is again, fee increases. We're just, uh, this is our year for a 3% fee increase and we're just asking for fee increases across the board. Uh, we estimate that this will add about 52,000 in revenue to the EMS line. And just for your edification, uh, EMS system is, is about a 50-50 fee for tax pay. So, you know, I've never used our EMS system, but I still pay to have it there as a citizen. Uh, if I were to use it, then I would also pay for the service as well. So, how do you determine whether, or maybe not so much inside the city, but we have a determination of an air ambulance coming, picking up, or ground transportation? How is that determined? Uh, the the nature of the the injury, as well as the distance. Uh, if it's, you have to realize that for us to ask for Life Flight to launch. Have them launch, have them arrive, have them land, have them load a patient, and then relaunch. There's really a, a time frame, right? At some point, it's just easier to put them in the back of the ambulance. Uh, if I'm all the way down in Downey, uh, maybe in some of the remote areas, and it's a major trauma, uh, we will likely ask for a life flight launch, uh, or I should say, life flight, uh, a medical air, air, air ambulance. They're all. They have their own names now. Um, uh, an air ambulance, uh, if it's close, uh, McCammon, Income, we're likely not going to just because it's almost uh, as effective for us to uh, just load and transport. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we don't need any guidance uh, from this, but that was just for your edification. Any follow up questions? I feel edified. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank any, you so much for your time. Appreciate uh, the support, and uh, we'll continue to do good things in the fire department. I'm real proud of our department. I think we work real hard. I look around, and uh, you know, Idaho Falls has, was running about 130 uh, personnel, seven ambulances, and uh, quite a bit more resources, and they are only running about uh, 2,000 calls more than us. So, um, you know, we. We work hard, but unfortunately it tears, tears our guys up quite a bit, so. 
Well, I want you to know we appreciate you and, and we appreciate the fire department and what you guys do. It's, it's nice to have somebody that knows what they're doing and that does it so good and uh, very trained and very, very qualified. So well, thank, thank you for everything you're doing. We demonstrate Schubert Heights Safe Haven. Please, please make sure everybody knows that. I mean, we've got a few of them out here right now, but please make sure everybody knows that we appreciate Absolutely. what they what they do. And it just shows you we're a lot more efficient than Idaho Falls is, obviously. <laughs> so, so thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right, with that then, that uh, concludes our uh, presentations right now. Ashley, we have a budget meeting next Thursday. I don't remember who will be on the docket. We have um, parks, recreation, transit, science and environment, and property abatement. Okay. So that's what we'll have next Thursday for our for our meetings, and it sounds good. Thank you very much for your work today. Thank you, Council, for being here. It's a, has been a long day, so thank you, and with that, we are adjourned. <laughs>